quick intro here. Back to the magic band from Disney. So yes, they can definitely track you with it and how it works and how you can use it on your own and enable it. Will you see in this video? Hey guys, today we will continue with the Disney magic band reverse engineering. And I finally looked into the firmware and this will be quite a long story to tell, but let's see how it goes. It will most likely be a lot of rambling and showing back and forth, but please uh, be patient. Uh, let's see how it goes. So here's my test setup. I have the Magic Band internals with again the um, NFC tech and the NRF31512 microcontroller with an 8051 core. We have two NRF 24L01 modules connected each to an ESP32. And one is used to transmit data and one is used to receive data at the same time. Also, we have again the Nordic PPK2, which is used to see the current draw the device is doing, the PCB, as we have no other feedback, no LED, no nothing. And that basically looks like this. And it's really funny to see that we have now four microcontroller or boards from Nordic in between. I also have the HackRF here, which I use to just see if the um, NRF is sending out anything at all. And so let's start. So where do we go? Ah, okay. The last time we ended up at the main function of the firmware and I showed it uh, very shortly. For the last past few nights I now looked deeply into it and renamed most of the stuff that is interesting like here the GPIO initialization. I made a git script to import all the naming of the uh, special function registers to see it simpler and yeah also reversed most of the functions uh, in it but if we go to the do rf part function and look into the rf init function and look even closer into it we have for once here the rf white registers these are basically the same as for the NRF L, uh, 24L01. And based on this, I was able to get quite far into it and to see what the uh, magic band is really doing. Only that here, for example, the RF address was not possible to reverse as we have here this address 87. The last two numbers are not important here. And if we go there, it's back at the 87. We have here this RF address, but it is nowhere referenced at all. So it was quite hard to be stuck there. So I then took the hack RF and scanned a lot to see if um these peaks are on some specific channel or what it is doing there but i have never found anything on any of the possible channels of the nrf 24 or in this case 31. um the solution i came up with or this the solution i found was to look into the initialization of the 8051 core. It's basically like the stack initialization and the RAM initialization. We have this address here, which points to a byte array. And we can already see here this 87 value. I looked into the Kyle init function, which is used by, um, by the 8051 core. And we can see here an explanation of all the bytes that are in this array. So if we now decode it, we can see that we have um, byte address or RAM addresses where it will um, 
write to and how many bytes are there and such. So I decoded these values and you can see I named them also. So the RF address, the pipe address, the channel array. So this channel array, for example, uh, is the channel the radio can send on. And I filled them out. I made a custom script for it. An Arduino uh, code, one for sending and one for receiving. And sorry for the blurriness. I am having just a simpler time screen recording it that way. And I know you will not like it, but still. Here you can see I'm setting all the registers like the um, firmware was doing as well after I reversed it that far. And so I could test really the transmission of a packet and receive it on the other side via the other ESP32 you can see here. And I'm now printing out this uh, receiving part on channel one. You can see there is no FIFO content, so it is not displaying any bytes. After playing back and forth and reversing it further, we have the pipe addresses and the RF address. And the RF address is what the NRF is sending on and the pipe address is where it receives data. Based on the reversing, if we can find it, we have for once here a function uh, Rx on channel 82. And it is um, defining beforehand how many bytes it is expecting or it's, it wants to receive. So I knew I had to play around with here six bytes. And in the TX function, it is um, talking about eight bytes. So I could use that to um, reverse or yeah, to just play around with these values quite a lot. And I'm sending out six byte to the magic band. And I'm trying to receive eight bands as these are the only values that are mentioned in the firmware. And I played around with it. I was able to use this six byte array and finally saw some different peaks in the firmware. After I looked into the uh, Rx function and I saw that this will be called every time, I saw that, okay, uh, the byte 20C, with, uh, which is the one, the first one of the loaded radio byte array needs to be zero or one. I played a lot around with the other values in that byte array, um, but never got anything just really different and still no transmission on any of the channels. So the last solution then was to just randomly set the registers to uh, values and just wait for a while and see what is happening. I'm, I finally found the value three in the first byte and all the others just zero. Even while it's not tested here, it seems to be just used later. Just that I haven't found where this uh, RAM address is used again until now, but maybe that's not so important anymore. Okay, so as we now know, the magic band is not sending anything out. It just wakes up every two seconds and waits for a packet on this specific pipe. And I have this one ESP32 now, which will send out this byte array and the magic band will receive it. And this magic number, num number three, will enable then the transmission of the NRF. And I will just show it. So we can see that if I reset the ESP32, which will send out, it will send for 15 seconds, like here. And the moment the NRF wakes up and receives that exact package, 
it will go into a fast peak mode, I would say, and will transmit um, bursts, um, burst ID values for a short amount of time. After that is done, it will then um, send the ID every X seconds and will go through the list of channels it has available. And as the luck wants it, it's now of course not working. Let's try it one more time. I'm just here revetting it. Ah, now we have it. So while it is receiving this three message, it is sending burst signals out and you can see the burst signals being received here as well. These are now coming from the NRF and after the ESP32 that was transmitting this three magic number um, goes off again, you can see it's periodically sending it every second, but I'm now only listening on channel one, so it will only uh, show every now and then. If I would also listen on the other channels, it will show it as well. And if we took, take a look at the message itself, we have here the magic band ID, which are, let me guess, five bytes. Yeah, and we have for once a counter, and this should be the battery, something like that, and another value that is not known by now. But if we scroll down, we can see that the counter has increased and it will increase on everything sending. So on the other channels, it has the other values in. Now the other ESP32 is turned off and it's still periodically sending. And I think it is doing this for about two hours until it will turn off again. And you need to send this burst signal. I know this is still a lot of rambling and back and forth, but it's hard to get it across. So what can you do with all this information? Basically, if you have some of these magic bands at home and want to use it for proximity sensing or stuff like that, you could use one ESP32, which will listen on channel one, two, or through all the channels just to have better reception. And it will send out periodically, like every minute or so, for 30 seconds, the, the magic number three. So you can then um, receive the um, magic band ID content. There's really not much in it. It's no not encrypted, no nothing. And you can also get the magic band ID if you read out the NFC tag. It is uh, not connected to the um, to the microcontroller, but it still has it saved in there in the memory region. So you can just scan it via NFC and you know the ID you want to listen for and you can then yeah, scan around. There are multiple other functions in the firmware but I did not find any yeah, usage or how to, how they are used. And so I think mostly they are related to um, debug functions. As we have here in the main function, this big fat debug zone. And if we take a closer look into it, it implements stuff like writing its own address into the OTP region. So I guess they have a solution to either by pins or via um, VRF to send or to write the, the magic band ID into memory. So they can produce them all with the same firmware and later it will write the magic band number into a very deep down memory region, which we have here. So, and this is also used as a pipe zero address. So you can even send direct messages 
to one magic band to enable the sending, for example, or to have the other functions which are unknown till now and will most likely not be reversed any further. So I think that's it. It's a very nice journey overall from really the unknown microcontroller to reversing the 8051 core a bit deeper. It's really such a hassle to look into and uh, Gitra is nice as it has this pseudo code generator, but it's also very bad at figuring out which um, function calls are generated how. But it's also understandable on how the 8051 core works. It was nice to see the uh, init code and also that you can reverse that way that they used Kyle to compile it. And furthermore, I hope you like to join me in on this. Uh, I'm very surprised that the first video got so much attention. And I'm most likely sure that this one will get way better reception as it's such a long rambling video. But still, maybe you will like it. Have a great day.